Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Did Shakespeare. My name is Cassidy Cash, that Shakespeare girl, and we're diving into the world of food in Elizabethan England. Now this subject is a huge topic and I didn't even realize how big until I started researching this week's episode. As you know, if you've been following along on the Facebook page, this week we've been focusing on different herbs and plants and foods that might have been eaten by William Shakespeare himself. And we've highlighted a couple of them on the Facebook page, so hop over there and check that out. But here on this episode, what I want to focus on is the different kinds of meals that people would eat in 16th and 17th century England. Now remember, we're focusing on 1564 to 1616 only, and there's a lot of history before and after that, so I do encourage you to look into that further. But for that 52 years, there was actually a lot of brand new foods that got introduced to England, and there were a lot of rules governing what you could eat, when, how much, and with whom, and what you could wear while you were eating these things. Yes, it was involved. So this week, we're diving in to find out more by asking the question, did Shakespeare eat lunch? Like most things in Shakespeare's lifetime, what people did was divided up by class. The royal class handled life one way, the middle class had a different way, and the lower class and the poor had different ways as well. There were different rules and different ways that you dressed and different ways that you ate and consumed food. And depending on your class station, it drastically changed what your day-to-day -day life would look like. For William Shakespeare, he was part of the class which might have eaten breakfast, but it would have been like some bread, maybe some cheese, and probably ale. And that is contrary to what we do now. We don't typically eat or drink alcohol first thing in the morning, but you do have to remember that ale in Elizabethan times was not the high alcohol content that you think of now. So it wasn't quite the same experience. It was basically doctored up water because the actual water you can't drink because the sanitation was awful and you couldn't drink the water. Depending on your station, you would either get up like four in the morning to be eating your breakfast before you went and served it to someone else who ate around six. And then that person would go and serve someone else who ate around eight. And it was, it's all kind of crazy and divided up by class. So we're gonna deal with some generalities here today. Um, basically because each class station, you could write an entire book on just their meals and how they ate them. And this is just a conversation after all. So we're gonna have a conversation about lunchtime. Lunchtime wasn't actually a thing. Like they didn't call it lunch. You had breakfast, dinner, and supper, which from the Southern United States where I live, that is what a lot of people here call it as well. And I kind of wonder if that's related, but that's a topic for another video. Technically, Shakespeare did not eat lunch, but only because the word lunch was not what they would have called the midday meal. But they did eat a midday meal, and the midday meal was the big meal of the day. It was the bulk of your nourishment, it was when you ate the largest meal of the day, and it was when you consumed the most food. Like you would sit down and this was a big thing. Now you could get your midday meal in a lot of different ways. If you had a home where you could consume food there with your family, then often the person who ran the house, the wife or the mom of the family would cook a meal and you would eat it there. There were ale houses and taverns where you could go and have your meal cooked. One article I read said that a lot of people would not have ovens in their own home. So they would actually make bread at home and then take it to the baker. The baker would bake it for them, which is why he's called a baker. He bakes your bread. And then you would take the baked bread back home then to be eaten throughout the day. That's fascinating to me. I had not thought about why a baker was called a baker as opposed to like a bread maker or something. Some foods that they would have had at this big midday meal included some things that you would normally think of in terms of meat and vegetable breads and cheeses. But interestingly, vegetables were really cheap and meat was 
a luxury and quite expensive. So while the royal aristocratic people of England would actually up to 80% of their diet was made up of meat and only a little bit of vegetables, the poorer classes, some of them didn't eat meat at all because it was too hard to get. And so they would eat probably 80% vegetables and then a little bit of meat. Of course, if you were on a farm and you raised your own meat, you could do that. You could, you know, there was like a time of year, usually around November when you would slaughter the meat um, and preserve it to last you then through the winter. I remember, and, and you may have seen this movie, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. There was a lady who begs the sheriff not to run off with the pig because the pig would feed them through the winter. And that was a real expression. It was a real issue. They would, the poor people would have the animals that they had raised and the meat from those animals was what was literally going to sustain them for the entire winter. Now, from what we know about William Shakespeare, he didn't live in Stratford-upon-Avon with his wife. So he wasn't like going from London home to Stratford every day to have meals there with them. So his midday meal was probably eaten at one of the taverns or when he was boarding with uh, different families in London. We have records of Shakespeare living at houses as a renter, basically. He might have eaten with them as well. So he had a couple of options of where he could get his food. Obviously, when he was appearing at court, he would participate in the meal that was served at the court banquet. So he would also get food there. There were lots of markets where you could buy stuff. And Elizabethan England was under strict culinary laws. They were called sumptuary laws. And basically Queen Elizabeth put in, I mean, just ridiculous amounts of laws. She actually said that you have to eat fish on certain days. I believe it was Wednesdays and Saturdays. And it seems like there was one other day of the week where you had to eat fish. And there were times where you had to fast. And so you could only eat fish. You couldn't have other kinds of meat and you couldn't have eggs and dairy and different things. Um, around Lent, it was like prescribed culinary, you must adhere to these foods. And actually it helped the fish industry. That was what it was designed to do was to help the fish industry grow. Now, because history is fun and the different kinds of foods that they might have had are neat, I wanted to tell you about some of the foods that play a role in Shakespeare's plays, which mean that he obviously knew about them. It's no evidence whatsoever that he ate them or liked them or fixed them himself or anything like that. But it is evidence of what was being consumed and what his audience would have recognized for the time period. And they're foods that we don't typically have now. Now, every single one of Shakespeare's plays mentions food. So food played a huge role in Shakespeare's life. And it certainly played a huge role in that of his audience. But here's 10 different foods that you may not think of normally and that are kind of, kind of fun little foods. Okay, so first you've got Shrewsbury cakes. In Twelfth Night, Toby Belch roars out about, there shall be no more cakes and ale. And the general consensus among historians is that the cakes he's talking about in Twelfth Night is Shrewsbury cakes. They were a popular sort of confection. They're round and they were flavored with rose or maybe lemon. And there's a cookbook called The Complete Cook um, by um, a man who, or a woman, I suppose, who's initials are WM from 1658. Now that cookbook is obviously after Shakespeare died, but the Shrewsbury cake was, existed before this book came out. It's just his book really goes into detail on what's included in it and things like that. The next one is Gooseberry Foil. Henry IV Part Two. Falstaff says, all the other gifts a pertinent man, as the malice of this age shapes them, are not worth a gooseberry. Gooseberry was a popular berry used in a lot of different things. Um, one popular dessert it was used in was the Gooseberry Foil. It's also called Gooseberry Fool. So I may actually be pronouncing the, the written version incorrectly, F-O-Y-L-E could be pronounced fool in Shakespeare's time. I need to learn more original pronunciation to know that, but um, there is a spelling of F-O-Y-L-E and then 
a pronunciation that tells you it's pronounced fool. But either way, it's like a pudding dessert made with gooseberries. This one was fun. Periwinkles were popular. And to me, living in the United States, periwinkle is a flower. But in Shakespeare's lifetime in England, and I think still today they eat these as a snack. It is actually a snail and they're cooked up, you know, maybe fried, but they're served wrapped in paper a lot like we do um, fish and chips or, or you could do uh, French fries that way here in the States or popcorns often served that way here in the States wrapped up in paper cone and you just eat them. I think that exists. Um, if, if my online research of what people have written about them holds true, someone from England tell me, do you eat periwinkles? But they are little bitty snails, and Orlando in As You Like It um, declares of a snail. Um, that's a long story. You should look and see why he said that. But the, the periwinkles, or the word snail, is actually referenced um, about four times in Shakespeare's work. For him, they were most likely cooked up and served as a kind of snack. Henelm Digby, in 1699, he, or 1669, I'm sorry, he called them blue buttons. And they were thought to be good for skin troubles. Like if you ate them, it would help your skin. Ambergris is another one which is fun. Um, Ambergris is mentioned in The Merry Wives of Windsor. When Mistress Ford is, is ranting, she talks about Ambergris indirectly by saying, What tempest I trow through this whale with so many tons of oil in his belly ashore at Windsor. And she's talking about like a whale tossing his lunch, you know, throwing up. And ambergris is actually whale vomit. To be super technical and very gross, it is actually a whale secretion. So it can come out of either end of the whale, but it was used in Shakespeare's lifetime to flavor different kinds of food. Um, ambergris is really good at making a particular fragrance or flavor stay as opposed to wear off. And so you put it in foods to help enhance the flavor. It was a popular cooking additive. There are recipes for things like uh, posset was another popular dessert. And it's mentioned in Mary Wives of Windsor. And the recipe for it that you can find um, includes at the end, once you finish the posset, it says, now you can add ambergris to keep the flavor. And posset was made with sugar, eggs, white wine, and was combined together to make a kind of pudding. You could flavor it with the rose water or the lemon or the whatever. They didn't really eat a lot of fresh fruits in Elizabethan England. They were very, very skeptical of fresh fruits. They felt it was dangerous, that raw fruit could hurt you somehow. They would find out later that it was really some of their cooking, or I guess they didn't find it out. We know now that their cooking implements created some bad reactions with the acids in the fruits to create a poison, not from the food, but from the pewter bowl that they were cooking in. I know that's true for tomatoes. Um, I, I think that that fear of raw fruit is based in that similar type of thing. I don't actually know that part. Salad, warden pies, and junkets were three other ones that I thought were very interesting. So basically the answer to this week's question of whether or not Shakespeare ate lunch is yeah, but they, he didn't call it that. So he did eat a huge midday meal um, that was the main meal of the day. There was, oh, oh, this was cool. There wasn't this idea that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. For Shakespeare and his contemporaries, the midday meal was the most important meal of the day. And I thought that was surprising. You know, we think of, you've got to be charged up for the day, but culturally that wasn't the way it was for Shakespeare. His main meal was at lunchtime. That's it for this week here at That Shakespeare Girl. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Did Shakespeare and that you learned something new about the Bard. If you liked this video, please hit like and subscribe. Every like that this video gets helps this information reach more people who love to learn about the Bard. And as you know, as Shakespeareans, we love to have friends. So I'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.